Would you please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12. And I'd like to go ahead and read that text as we begin. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. Paul writes to the Galatians, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. So ends the reading of God's Word. May He bless this part of His Word to our understanding this morning. Now last week we saw how Paul had reminded the Galatians of the serious consequences of receiving circumcision as a part of their justification, as a part of their acceptance with God, adding that as a work to be done in order to be saved. Paul says to them, if they receive circumcision, Everything that Jesus Christ has done would not help them at all. And we remember that that is true, not just of adding circumcision, but of any work that we might do, trusting in that for our salvation. Paul says that if you do that, the righteousness of Christ will not cover your nakedness. If you do that, his death will not atone for your sins. If you do that, his acceptance with the Father will not be your acceptance. His intercession will not be for you. He will not give you of His Holy Spirit. And you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven with Him. Basically, Paul says, if you trust in anything else, you will not receive anything of what Jesus Christ has done. They will receive nothing from Him. He says, furthermore, that if they receive circumcision, they would actually be committing themselves to keep the rest of the law. In other words, they would be entirely relying upon their own works to save them. They would have to keep up the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. They would have to observe all the laws, even the separation laws, the ceremonial laws. But most importantly, they would have to rely upon their own obedience to the moral commandments of God to commend them to God. If they failed in the slightest, they would be condemned. And of course, the point the scripture reminds us of is that they're already condemned through Adam. They've already lost their salvation. They cannot be perfect. And not only did they come into this world with Adam's sin clinging to them, but they've sinned many more times since. They would be without hope. And why is that? Because if they sought to be justified by law, they would be cutting themselves off from Jesus Christ. Paul says they would be falling from grace. They would no longer be looking to Christ's obedience, but their own obedience to save them. Now, Paul is not saying that they would lose their salvation, but what he is saying is that if you can go in this direction, turn away from Christ and his perfect righteousness in order to be justified or declared righteous by God on the basis of your own righteousness, you never really knew him to begin with. You've fallen away from a principle of grace, trusting in a gift, a free gift, earned by Christ and given to you, and then relying rather upon your works to commend you to God. That's what it means to fall from grace. Now Paul went on to remind us that those who are Christ go at it a completely different way. They're not looking to their works, but they're looking to Christ and His works. The Spirit of God who works inside of us makes us look away from ourselves, from our obedience, from our righteousness, from the things that we do that we think God will, will accept us for, the things that He will enjoy, and makes us look to Jesus Christ and to Him alone. God does this by giving us faith. Faith is basically that which looks away from self and looks to Jesus Christ. He gives to us also the hope of a glorious future by giving us the confidence that one day we will be with him in glory because of his righteousness 
and not because of our own. That is what Christ does for his people. That is what Christ's people do in their own experience. They look to Christ and not to themselves for their salvation. Now the evidence of this hope, Paul says, is not an external sign that is applied to our bodies. It's not our circumcision. And to put it in New Testament terms, it's not our baptism. Baptism does not save us. Rather, it is the evidence that God gives to us that we truly are believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the fact that we are convicted of the truth of the facts of the Bible, that what the Bible says is true. The Bible says that the demons believe and they tremble. But rather, it is the loving acceptance of what the Bible says, the earnestness with which we receive these things and embrace them with our hearts and do what God calls us to do. That which shows that we are true Christians is not the fact that we've been baptized or circumcised, but rather that we love God the Father, that we love Jesus Christ, that we love the Spirit of God, that we love to worship the Lord, to, to spend time in Him with prayer, that we love to spend time with His people in fellowshipping with them, in ministering to them and being ministered to by them. The evidence of doing the Father's will and seeking for His glory in Christ and in His kingdom. Those are the evidences that we are God's people, not the water that was applied to our bodies not the circumcision that we may have received. Paul is saying that a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is one who looks to Christ and who loves him and follows him wherever he leads them. It's not a matter of external things done to me or things that I do. It is what Christ has done and whether or not I have received him with my whole heart. Now this week we see Paul putting a mirror, as it were, to the faces of the Galatians to give them a good look at themselves, to see what it is that they have been doing, listening to the Judaizers. He says that they had started well. They were going the right direction. They were running the good race, but someone had turned them out of the way. What they were following now was clearly not what Christ had been teaching them. Paul has already made that perfectly clear. And if it isn't from Christ, then obviously it's not the way that they can travel or should travel. It's not a safe way. Even though it may seem to them like a very small deviation, a very small addition to the gospel, Paul reminds them that it will eventually affect everything they believe, and it may very well affect the whole congregation. Paul had a strong hope that they would listen to him, that they would see their error and turn back to the truth. And he also hoped that from the fact that the Judaizers had misrepresented him, that that would be an encouragement to them not to listen to what they had to say. Then finally he expresses a desire for God's judgment to come upon those who were troubling them for all the danger that they had brought the Galatians into. Now this morning we're going to be considering each part of this appeal that Paul makes to the Galatians. But I want you to remember the overall purpose of what Paul is doing here. He is warning them to stop listening to these false teachers, to these false brethren, and to begin listening to the truth. Remember, the whole purpose of the sermon, as you look at the title, is basically this. We must beware of ungodly influences, of ungodly teaching, of things that are false, things that are lies, that will lead us away from the truth. And that's exactly what the Judaizers were doing to the Galatians. Now, first of all, Paul says in verse 7 that they shouldn't listen to those who were teaching them false doctrine because they had led them out of the way, out of the way of Christ. He says in verse 7, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, Paul says they did have a good start. They had listened to the gospel. They were living the life that Jesus had called them to live. He says you were running well. Oftentimes in scripture, the Christian life is likened to a race that we run. One that Paul says that we are to run faithfully. We are to run with all of our might. We are to be striving toward the finish line, trying to be the first one there. We are to strive to win. It's a race that we are to put effort into. Sometimes we get confused 
thinking that because our justification, our acceptance with God is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ, which it is, that there is nothing that we have to do. All we do is we say we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to church on Sunday, we sit in the pews or in the chairs or whatever we have here, we listen to the pastor preach a sermon, we sing the hymns, and then we go home, and that's all that's necessary. But that's not all that is necessary. The Lord tells us that when we trust in Jesus Christ, it is true that salvation is by His grace, that we are justified by His righteousness, but it's also true that there is a great deal of work for us to do. We must, pull, uh, we must put all of our efforts into becoming what Christ has called us to become, in doing what He has called us to do. We must put our sins to death, try to put them off and leave no room in our life for anything that is wrong. You know, the Bible says that if we love, live comfortably with any sin that we are not willing to give up, not sins that we're fighting against, that we're trying to put off, but if there are sins that we embrace, that we love and we refuse to give up, that we really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we must be killing all of our sins, putting them all to death, because a Christian hates their sins. Not just one, not just ten, not just a hundred, but all of them. And he seeks to kill them all. The Christian life is then also a life of growing in our holiness. As we put off our sins, we need to realize sins are not only doing the things that are wrong, but also not doing the things that are right. We, are, we should be striving to grow in our holiness, in our obedience, and in our love to Christ. We are to be using all that we have to do everything we can to glorify God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, the Lord says. Remember, Jesus says, if you are to be my disciple, you must pick up your cross and follow me. That means we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to the things that we may desire that are outside of his will and do the things that he calls us to do, using our gifts to serve him and his people, using our time and our resources and the opportunities that he gives to us to advance his kingdom. The Christian life is not a passive life. It's not a life of ease, but rather a life of labor. We don't like to think about that sometimes, but it's only because of the weakness of our flesh, isn't it? We are saved by grace through faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ alone, but we must still pick up our crosses and follow after him. That is what the Galatians had done. And they were running that race. And Paul says they were running it well. But now they were off course. They had turned out of the way. They were no longer serving Christ on his terms. Paul says they were in danger of losing the race altogether. And why is that? It's because someone had hindered them. Now, Paul already said who they were. Paul knew who they were. He already named them. It was these Jewish Christians that were trying to get them to come back to this halfway house between Christianity and Judaism. They wanted to mix the old covenant into the new covenant and hold on to those things that the Jews would have persecuted them for if they had let go of. Paul just wanted the Galatians to step back and to take a good look at what these teachers had done to them and whether or not they really had a good reason to turn away from Christ alone back to Judaism. You know, the sad fact is there are many who begin to follow Jesus Christ and who continue to do it for a while and then turn aside. They look like they know him. Maybe they profess faith in him. They seem to want to serve him. They appear to love him. But in many cases, they really don't. And after a while, it begins to show. They leave off following him. They no longer run the race. Eventually they leave the church altogether. They end up losing the prize. And of course there are also other situations where people begin to slow down, where people begin to get off course. Paul is not assuming here that these Galatians were not Christians because it can happen even to true believers. We can get derailed and off track. And if this happens to us, if we begin to slow down, if we begin to turn out of the way, we should begin asking ourselves, why? What's the problem? Why am I not following Jesus the way that I used to? Why don't I have the zeal that was once there? Why have I seemingly lost my first love? 
And of course the answer is not always easy. Sometimes it can be very complicated. But we know that there is one out there who is trying to trip us up. We know that Satan is very real. His demons are very real. Satan has laid snares everywhere around us. He has them that are specifically targeted toward us. He knows our weaknesses. He tempts us in those areas where we are most likely to fall and he has a, a very large arsenal in the world from which to draw. But also along these same lines, he will try to deceive us with false doctrine. He will try to teach us the things that we want to hear, to tickle our ears as we heard this morning, so that we will follow after those teachers, those who will make Christianity more palatable for us, perhaps make it easier for us, make it more fun. You know, Satan has found uh, many allies in the church today, hasn't he, in the whole church growth movement. Today, most churches that you attend, you can expect to, to find just about everything that you might like to do. You know, the kind of music you want to listen to, incorporate it into the worship, or the kind of fun and games you like to play. You know, I saw one church where they had a game room with the latest um, video games and plenty of computers to play them on. They had a cappuccino machine in the, in the foyer as you came in, as well as a full, a full service snack bar. I mean, everything that you, that you might want to, uh, to make you comfortable, make you feel at home, and, and to make it fun for you to be there. Now, I'm not saying that Christianity is not fun. <laughs> It is fun, but it's a different kind of fun, a different kind of pleasure, something that God's people find to be truly pleasurable, and that is the pursuit of God's glory and holiness. The kind of pleasure that the world finds uh, you know, enjoyment in, is not, it's not that all of those things are off limits for Christians, but that's not what we come to church for. We don't come to church, I hope, for cappuccino. I hope we don't come to church to play video games or to listen to rock and roll, but rather to worship God the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That is what Christianity is all about. But as I've said, Satan knows our weaknesses. He knows how to tempt us. He knows how to draw us away from the truth. He knows how to deceive us with false doctrine. He tells us the things that we would like to hear. And of course mixes it, frosts the cake you might say, with truth so that it looks like the right kind of thing. We need to be on our guard. We need to guard our weaknesses. We need to strengthen those areas where we are most vulnerable. But we also need to keep ourselves immersed in God's truth so that we will not be deceived by the lie. And we need to love the truth so that we will not want to turn aside from it to do these other things that though they might be fun outwardly, are really not going to do anything for your soul to make it stronger against the attacks of the enemy. So the first thing is the Galatians were running well, but someone had hindered them. Somebody had gotten them off the track. That's the first reason why, of course, we shouldn't listen to false teachers is because they will get us off the track. They will get us going the wrong direction. They will build us up in things that will not really help us spiritually, but really will only minister to our flesh and make it stronger. Secondly, Paul says, they shouldn't listen to those teaching them false doctrine because what they were being taught did not come from Christ. Now that shouldn't come as any surprise to us because we know Christ doesn't teach false doctrine. And Paul has already distinguished what the Judaizers were teaching from what he was teaching, which was the doctrine that our Lord Jesus Christ delivered to him. He says in verse 8, this persuasion did not come from him who calls you. Now Christ had commissioned Paul to preach his word. And the gospel that he had preached required faith in Jesus Christ and repentance from sin. That is what you must do to be saved. Remember the Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. We know from the scriptures that that includes also repentance, faith and repentance. That's conversion. Okay, But that is all that is necessary. That was the doctrine that he had preached. Christ gave them his Holy Spirit as the evidence that that doctrine was true. And he did not require them to keep the law of Moses and to be circumcised before they received the Spirit of God. Paul says, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Well, since it didn't come from God, if it didn't come from Christ, where did it come from? Well, it came from the Judaizers. But of course, behind the Judaizers, it was coming from Satan. Satan was trying to overthrow their faith. Satan hated them 
wanted to destroy them. Remember, Satan doesn't love you. Satan hates you. He hates you because you're God's creature. He wants to see you in hell with himself. He wants to do everything he can to try to damn you for all eternity. Of course, the fact is we come into this world already damned, don't we? And we need to be saved. But the Lord, if he mercifully saves us by his gospel, uh, Satan wants to do what he can to try to draw those false professors away. And if he could, he would even try to destroy those who were true. This is what's going on behind the scenes. This didn't come from Christ. It didn't come from the one who calls you. It comes from the devil. And how can we know the difference? How do we know what comes from God and what comes from the devil? I hope you realize there's only one way, and that is the word of God. As uh, Paul commended the Bereans, because they searched the scriptures to see whether or not what he was saying was true or false, we must do the same thing. God has given us only one standard. We know that he has spoken in his word. He has not given us many sources of truth, but only one. We have to examine our opinions and the opinions of all men by the touchstone of Scripture. You realize, of course, that's exactly what the early church fathers did. That's exactly what the apostolic fathers did. They recognize the authority of Scripture. That is what the whole church has done from the very beginning, except we did get off track somewhere along the line, uh, began to trust in the opinions of men and of councils and various other things, and not simply the Word of God. We must trust in Scripture because we know God has spoken here. If we cannot find it here, we, we, we should not submit to it. We cannot submit to it as God's rule. No matter how persuasive our teachers are, no matter how knowledgeable they are, no matter how charismatic they are, and false teachers rely heavily upon their personalities to lead people astray. I mean, this is a personality-driven culture, isn't it? If, if the person is polished enough, can speak persuasively enough, people follow them. But no matter how sincere they may seem, and no matter how sincerely they may seem to be concerned about your welfare, if what they say does not agree with the word of God, it must be rejected. God's word is the only safe rule, the only guide for our journey. It's the only map God has given to us to be able to find the end of the journey. And if we go any other direction, we will not end up in heaven. God's word is the only standard. And so Paul says, secondly, don't listen to the false teachers because what they are saying does not come from Christ. It does not agree with the word. Thirdly, he says, they shouldn't listen to false teachers because it doesn't take much, doesn't take much at all to corrupt them and those around them. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Paul says there was a danger of this infection spreading to others and, of course, spreading within themselves to corrupt their whole system of doctrine, their whole understanding of Scripture. I mean, the Galatians may have argued this is really no big deal because there's only a few among us that are even holding on to this, only a few among us who are teaching this. Or maybe they would argue it's really just a small deviation from the truth or from what you're saying, Paul. I mean, we still want to hold on to Christ, but we want to be circumcised now. And we want to observe the law of Moses. You know, maybe that seems like a small thing in their eyes. We really haven't rejected Jesus Christ. We've only added a little bit to his work. But Paul replies, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. You see, this is, I mean, there's a truth here that, that we need to realize. Even a small deviation can destroy everything that we believe, especially if it strikes closely to the heart of justification, which is exactly what the Judaizers were doing. Sometimes small errors can cause huge problems. It depends on how close it is to the very center of Christianity. And of course, in this case, as I've already said, they're adding works to justification. They're saying it's not purely by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and faith in his name alone, but rather it's faith in Christ plus your works may seem like a minor thing. I imagine somebody standing outside of Christianity looking in would say, why are you making such a big deal over something? It seems like such a minor issue. But Paul says to add works 
to God's grace destroys the grace of God because the two are mutually exclusive. Grace is a free gift by definition. It is something God does entirely and gives to us freely. He even gives us the faith to receive it. There's no work that we do at all. It is purely from first to last of His grace. If we add even the slightest amount of our works to it, then we are destroying the whole principle of grace. We're basically rejecting God's grace. And we're saying, no, I want it on my terms. I want it on works. Paul says, a little deviation, a little leaven. Leavens the whole lump of dough. And beyond that, he says, a little leaven can even leaven the whole lump in the sense that even if there are some that are affected by this doctrine, eventually the whole congregation will be affected by it. Very often, false doctrine is like cancer. And I, I'm a, I imagine all of us have had some experience with that. We know people who have experienced cancer. It's a very terrible disease. It starts in one area of your body and eventually as it metastasizes, goes throughout the whole body and begins to develop tumors in different places. But it's something that spreads through the whole body and kills the whole body, which is why you can't live with it. Well, false doctrine is very much the same way. If you tolerate it, it eventually spreads to the rest of the body and kills it, leads them astray as well. Therefore, Paul is saying they must not yield to it, but for their own well-being, as well as for those around them, they have to fight against it. They have to purge it out. As our Lord says, purge out the old leaven that you may become a new lump. Along these lines, we need to remember Never encourage anybody who holds to a dangerous doctrine. Do not embrace them as a brother. Even those, Paul says, who practice any sin. When you tolerate false doctrine, when you tolerate sinful practices, you are actually giving your endorsement to it. And if anybody respects you, they're eventually going to be influenced by your toleration for it. And they will tolerate it as well until others begin to tolerate it. Everybody becomes comfortable with it even as the Corinthian church did with the brother who was living in incest. Paul says you shouldn't have tolerated him. You should cast him out. You shouldn't have fellowship with him. He needs to know his sin. And he needs to be confronted with it. Otherwise, the whole congregation is going to be leavened by this sin. Cast that person out and purge out that leaven. Paul is saying the same thing needs to happen here. Don't support the false doctrine, but purge it out from your midst. And so thirdly, he's saying you shouldn't listen to false doctrine because even a little bit of it can corrupt your whole understanding of Scripture and it can even affect those around you and lead many people astray. Fourthly, he says they shouldn't listen to false teachers because they and those who listen to them will suffer the consequences of their errors. Look at verses 10 and 12. Paul says, I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Now it's interesting that Paul here, first of all, expresses his hope that through Christ, this false teaching would not finally overcome them. Paul was concerned about them. He had many doubts and fears regarding whether or not uh, they were going to continue to follow the Lord, but he hoped that through God's blessing and what he had written to them, they would be persuaded to turn away from these false teachers and to continue in the freedom of the gospel. He was hoping for the best, you see. And that's something, of course, that we should always do whenever we're dealing with someone who is led astray. Hope for the best, even though we may have cause to fear the worst. Now perhaps Paul was doing this so that they wouldn't be offended or at least they would be less offended by his warnings and his rebukes. What he does is he lays most of the blame on those who are teaching the doctrine rather than on those who are listening to it. As a matter of fact, it seems as though he's singling one person out. One person who above the rest is sort of the driving force behind this whole uh, teaching that they're having to deal with at this particular point. This reminds us that when we reprove our brethren for sins that they might be involved in, 
that we should always make a distinction between those who are leading and those who are being led by them. We need to deal more gently with those who are the ones being led than the leaders who are more culpable, as we're going to see in just a moment. But Paul brings in these extenuating circumstances in order to soften his rebuke so that he might persuade them to come back to Christ. But what about those who were leading? What about those who were the instigators of this? Paul says they would bear their judgment. God is going to deal with them as they deserve. Paul says in verse 12 that they would even mutilate themselves, which literally means that they would cut themselves off. There's been some debate over what that actually means, um, one that's um, perhaps a little bit... Um, <laughs> A little bit sensitive areas. One is basically, you know, beyond going uh, circumcision, just go all the way and castrate yourselves. In other words, if these guys would just, you know, cut it all off, right? Another interpretation is basically that they would be cut off from the church, that they'd be excommunicated, put out. And the most extreme view of what Paul might have in view here is basically that they would be cut off from the land of the living. As a matter of fact, uh, one expositor, whose name escapes me right now, uh, John Gill, said that this was a rabbinic way, a Jewish way, of saying that they would be cut off from the land of the living, that they would die, basically. We see Paul bringing an imprecation, a curse upon those who would lead Christ's people astray. Is it serious to be a false teacher? Well, it is in anything we teach that's wrong but especially when that teaching leads Christ's sheep to a point where they might actually be cast away forever. Remember what Jesus said about those who would mislead even uh, one of his children who believe in him, one of these little ones who believe in me? He says, it would be better for them that a millstone be hung around their neck and they be cast into the sea than they mislead even one of these little ones who trust in me. It's a very serious thing. And Paul certainly is bringing that out. He's telling the Galatians, to follow them is a serious thing. To be in their position is even more serious. This is what they deserve, to be cut off from the land of the living. And so fourthly, he's saying we shouldn't listen to false teachers because those who follow them are going to become like them. They're going to be cut off when they are cut off as well. Finally, Paul says they shouldn't listen to false teachers because they are deceivers. I think that's quite plain. But maybe it's not... Uh, as clear in what he says here, and I'll try to explain it to you in verse 11. He says, But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Now Paul here is defending himself. He's saying, I'm not teaching this doctrine. What, what was going on here was the Judaizers were saying that Paul was teaching the very same thing that they were teaching, trying to give some clout to their teaching. It appears that, that, I mean, Paul wouldn't have to defend himself if this isn't something that they were saying about him. And the reason why they did this might be because on one occasion, Paul took Timothy and he had Timothy circumcised. And the Judaizers might point to, to Paul and say, look, Paul's doing exactly the same thing that, that we're teaching. I mean, he had Timothy circumcised, so why don't you get circumcised too? You know, Paul believes the same things that we believe, but... Of course, Paul is saying that isn't the case. It is true that Paul had Timothy circumcised, but it wasn't for Timothy's justification. It was rather for Timothy's acceptance among the Jewish community because he had a Jewish mother and a Greek father. And the Jews in that area knew that, and they would be offended if Timothy had not been circumcised. So Paul did that in order to open the door for the gospel to be preached. It was a thing indifferent to Paul. Timothy could be circumcised or uncircumcised as far as he was concerned, but not to the Jews. But he was not preaching circumcision and saying that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. Now, if Paul had done this, he might have avoided a great deal of persecution, which obviously he did not. Paul says that if he had, then the offense of the cross could have been avoided. Since to the Jews... The doctrine of justification and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone and in him crucified would be removed. See, that's the thing that the Jews really hated about Paul's preaching. You're saying, Paul, 
that Christ and him crucified is all we need and we can abandon circumcision, we can abandon the law and everything that has to do with that. That was the thing that really made the Jews angry and upset. Paul is saying, if I was preaching what the Judaizers say that I was preaching, why are the Jews persecuting me? The reason why the Judaizers were holding on to it was so that they would avoid persecution. If Paul had taught what the Judaizers taught, the Jews would not have been offended. But what Paul is saying here is that he, as well as others, were willing to risk their lives to teach the truth of the gospel, even though it meant they were going to be persecuted for it. And in doing that, Paul is proving that he did not preach what the Judaizers had charged him with preaching. You see, the Judaizers were being very deceptive here. They were trying to enlist Paul in their ranks. They're saying that, look, the great apostle Paul believes the same thing that we believe, and so you should listen to it. Whether they did this um, you know, in a, because they wanted to deceive the Galatians or because they themselves were deceived, we don't know. But either way, what they were saying was wrong. And so we shouldn't listen to false teachers because they are either deceived themselves or they're simply trying to be deceptive to lead us astray. Now Paul this morning has given to us several good reasons not to listen to false teachers and to fall under their ungodly influence. Let me just remind you what they are. If we listen to false teachers, they will lead us out of the way. They will get us out of the racetrack, the race that Christ calls us to win. If we listen to them, we'll be listening to things that Christ has not taught us things that don't belong to him, things that are not his truth. And obviously as Christians, we want to listen to the shepherd and not to those who are going to lead us astray, whom the Bible characterizes as wolves coming in among the flock, not sparing them, but seeking to lead them astray. If we listen to them, we will not only put ourselves in danger of corrupting our beliefs, but will also put those around us in danger as well. When we bring a false doctrine into the church, we affect not only ourselves, but we also affect other people. If we listen to them and follow them, we will suffer the same consequences they will for their errors. Which means if the end of the road for them is hell, that's the same thing that we'll get if we follow them. And finally, we need to realize that false teachers are deceived at the very best, and deceivers at the very worst. If we listen to them, we may also become deceived. I don't know how many people you know who have made the study of false doctrine their, their heart's delight, you know, their, their goal in life, and they study it and study it, and eventually they leave Christianity and go that direction. Have you ever met anyone like that? I know at least two that I can think of that did that very thing. Don't study the false doctrine don't make that your life study, your life work. Study the truth. As a matter of fact, if you want to guard yourself against false doctrine, the best thing you can do is study the truth. In the same way that um, people who work with money, you know, and in the merchandising business and so forth, and bank tellers and so forth, the way that they are taught to recognize uh, the counterfeit bills is not to study counterfeit bills all day, but to study the true or the right or the, the, the real ones. Once they know that, that real one so well, they can spot a counterfeit as soon as it comes. And that's one of the reasons why we want to focus here in this church on teaching the truth so you'll recognize error immediately when you see it. Well, here are several good reasons to keep ourselves immersed in God's truth. You know, we have so many teachers today. I mean, not only in the history of the church, and the history of the church is really a history of one teacher after another standing up and saying you ought to listen to me and follow this doctrine and this doctrine. There's been a lot of error and the church has learned a lot through all of those things. But the same thing is happening today. A lot of people today rising up and teaching false doctrines. And again, those that um, the book of Galatians is so clearly against. Teaching that our justification, our acceptance with God is not just dependent upon believing in Christ and his righteousness, but also in our works. In a case like this, we need to take the counsel that God gave through Jeremiah to his people in Judah, where he says in Jeremiah 6.16, Stand by the ways and see, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls.
we don't need to look for a, a new interpretation of Scripture. We don't need to look for another lens to view these truths through. We need to stand firm on what God has already delivered to us. The church has learned a great deal in her history. And we need to make sure we stick to those paths, to the paths of basically, I mean, this is the safest path to walk in, justification by grace through faith alone. That is the, the very hallmark of Christianity. We need to hold to the old paths, those that have been expressed in a number of creeds throughout the history of the church, those that are verified by Scripture and not go in for these new fads that are going to lead people astray. Hold fast to the truth and don't let anyone take it away from you. Well, may the Lord help us to listen to this admonition of Paul to the Galatians because remember the Spirit of God is also directing this to us this morning. Let's listen to it and hold fast to Christ and to Him alone for our justification. Let's bow for a few moments of meditative prayer and ask God to apply this to our hearts.